The Dreamer family is central to Undertale's story. Their tragedy sets the entire plot into motion. Asriel and Kara's buttercup plan eventually cost both children their lives. Their deaths pushed Asgore to declare war on humanity, and Toriel retreated to the ruins in her disgust. Asriel's death eventually led to Flowey's creation, but the curious thing about the whole situation was just how ill-prepared Toriel and Asgore were. And more concerningly, how even beyond Asriel's death, there are some troubling undercurrents with their parenting. Undercurrents that ripple across worlds. It would seem that, despite their best efforts, the Dreamer parents simply cannot understand children who struggle with mental health issues, and I think in analyzing what we know about their parenting styles and contrasting Asriel with both Kara and Chris from Deltarune, some eye-opening details come to light. Sibling Contrast We do not know much about Asriel's life before Kara or Chris in either game. What we do know is that in both universes, Asriel and his respective human sibling were quite close. Asriel and Kara seem to confide in each other so deeply, in fact, that Asriel outright admits that Kara hated humanity and came to Mount Ebot for an unhappy reason. There are certainly concerning undertones to their relationship. A lot of codependency and Kara putting a ton of pressure on Asriel to enact the Buttercup plan, on top of being the one to carry their own corpse via Asriel's body to the surface. Now, personally, I do not think Kara is the evil mini Light Yagami that many people believe. I see them as a deeply flawed and perhaps even traumatized kid who had a lot of pent up resentment towards humanity in the world, who were put on a pedestal by monsters. They likely did not have a healthy frame of reference for positive relationships, and had poor coping mechanisms. While you can read malice into them laughing off Asgore's buttercup poisoning, Undertale presents many examples of characters smiling laughing through pain. It is entirely possible to read Kara's reaction to the poisoning as panicked laughter, and their method of death as poetic justice. Of course, I'm not really looking to engage in the stupid offender versus defender discourse. Rather, I think it's striking that Kara had this many burdens. And the Dreamer parents, to our knowledge, did not seem to notice. Asgore describes Kara as having a look of hope in their eyes, and while we don't get much of Toriel's personal feelings, the fact that the Buttercup plan was secret likely means they never found out. They may have just assumed Kara fell deathly ill due to natural causes. Moreover, it's likely that they had no idea that Kara carried so many burdens, or if they did, they had no idea how to react. Because, if Deltarune is any indication, Asriel is a very happy, sociable, and beloved kid. Even in Undertale, the glimpses we get of him pre-Buttercup plan show a happy, cheery, and friendly boy with a mischievous streak. In Deltarune, he has many trophies. The townspeople speak of him with nostalgic fondness. By all accounts, he seems to be a very emotionally healthy guy despite his family's divorce and his time away at college. But then you contrast this with Chris. Their side of the room is barren, barring a few small things like the ominous birdcage. Asgore struggles to remember if Chris likes big bear hugs. Toriel doesn't seem to directly confront any of Chris's problems at all. She keeps her room locked to prevent Chris from stealing chocolates. She seems both shocked and delighted at the prospect of Chris making an actual friend. She seems aware of the codependency Chris had with Asriel. It doesn't take more initiative in helping them come out of their shell. She holds their hand while walking them to school, and Chris looks rather resigned to it. Toriel is usually Chris's go-to partner in group projects rather than their classmates. The TV has been unplugged for a long time. When you flush the toilet repeatedly, Toriel grumbles about bath bombs but does nothing to stop Chris from their weird antics. Asgore in Chapter 1 is open to Chris staying with him whenever they like, but he is fairly hands-off, and judging by his surprised reaction when he visits the shop, it's possible that he and Chris haven't seen each other much since the divorce. The two parents do briefly discuss Asriel's return, and Chris gets a brief mention, yet there's little talk of any problems Chris might be facing. And when Toriel raises concern about Chris to Alphys, Alphys insists they are normal. But most crucially, if you call during this room, Chris further insists that they are normal. Now, this at a glance is just a comedic bit, since they are balancing garbage on their head, and Chris doesn't want Toriel to see this. However, I think this reaction has some telling undertones with Chris as a character. Namely, that Chris isn't normal by conventional, happy family standards, and they may have internalized this and feel some shame and discomfort as a result. What's more worrying is how little is done to confront this. When Chris goes into the bathroom and leaves the sink running, Toriel tells Susie that this is just something Chris does. She hasn't faced it, to her knowledge, or if she has, she's given up trying to stop these habits. She knows Chris likes knives and keeps one on their person. There's no way she isn't aware of how barren Chris's room is, and she certainly isn't neglectful, as she's quick to welcome Susie into their home, worries about them when they disappear during Chapter 1, and nostalgically reflects on Chris's childhood. She's also checked out a book on human care multiple times. But there's this air of just 
resignation. A sort of complacency on both parents' part. Like they don't know how to deal with a child who is anything less than happy. That they don't understand why their love isn't helping more. Azrael grew up just fine under their care, yet Chris has their gremlin-like delinquent tendencies and has been a loner up until recently. More troubling are some details in Castletown and Chris's room. Like how their wardrobe says that they could wear anything they want. The room in the castle is more vibrant, full of similar trophies and accolades as their brother, yet their real bedroom is so barren and drab. Could this be a reflection of Chris feeling like they truly cannot express themselves around their mother and maybe a hint of jealousy toward Asriel? Meanwhile, in Undertale, Kara had their own problems that only Asriel seemed to understand and likely never told their parents. Asgore and Toriel remember simply things like Kara filling up their water glass for efficiency, but perhaps they never realized just how troubled this kid was. Then there's Asgore's tendency to place responsibility on the shoulders of children. For instance, with Kara, he built them up as the future of humans and monsters, and that could have easily fed into a complex for them. And then with Chris, he gave them the flowers to give to Toriel instead of facing her himself. This coupled with his desire to get Sans to tell him how to fix his family, and the way that he handles Frisk in Undertale, which we'll touch on a little bit more in the next section, Asgore's got a problem with trying to simultaneously build people up, and in doing so, places the unwanted burden of responsibility on them in the process. What's interesting is that these concerning aspects of their parenting extend beyond Kara, Chris, and Asriel after the tragedy. In Undertale, Toriel is a very doting person. She means well, but she's so overprotective that she basically handholds Frisk through the ruins until the long hallway where they test their independence, but even there, she asks them to stay behind while she runs errands. This, of course, is an exercise in futility. You have to proceed at some point, and when you do, she worries about Frisk leaving the room. And when you finally reunite, she fusses all over again, yet it's clear she wants Frisk to stay, as she's already prepared a room and a pie for them. Yet the room contains shoes in a disparity of sizes. There are already dusty toys. If you try to exit through the basement, she forces you back upstairs without giving a clear answer as to why. She is very welcoming and promises to be a good teacher and provide for Frisk, yet she does this all without asking what they want. She just assumes. She decides for them that this is what is best. She means well, again, as she just wants to prevent another human casualty, there's a hole in her heart that's grown wider and wider with each passing child, and she deserves sympathy and compassion for that. Yet Toriel naively assumes that being a loving and doting mother is enough to make her child stay with her. She doesn't understand the needs of a child who may not feel comfortable here. A child who came to a mountain where people are said to disappear. And while I don't think Frisk has to have tragic motives the way that Kara did, as much of Frisk's personality and backstory are malleable, it does show a lack of foresight on Toriel's part. The idea that a child could be unhappy living with her is a difficult pill to swallow. It's only at the end of her fight that she realizes this, and even then, she closes herself off until the reunion in the pacifist run. The two Toriels are fairly different, and yet there are some similar overprotective traits, such as the way that Deltarune Toriel made Asriel go to church for a straight week after finding out that he had kissed Braddy. The big difference is that Undertale's Toriel has endured a severe amount of heartache, even becoming an alcoholic at one point if the alarm clock dialogue is any indication. But this does reinforce that Toriel struggles with the idea that her parenting style may not be sufficient, that love and adoration are not always enough to meet the needs of a child. Asgore in Undertale makes an interesting contrast. His first impulse is to give up his life so Frisk can return to the surface, but if we spare him, he imagines a simple life with him and Toriel as Frisk's parents. But if you play on a run where you've killed Flowey before, and Flowey does not kill him, he realizes this is just a fantasy and takes his own life so that Frisk can go to the surface and find another way to break the barrier. This is a more jaded Asgore with far greater burdens, yet much like Toriel, he is acting based on his own personal feelings and assumptions, basing this on what he thinks Asriel would want, and based on Kara at their most hopeful. And yet, it's not just Kara, or even Frisk, or the previous humans we must consider, but Flowey as well. Flowey discusses how, after he revived, he was unable to love anyone, not even his parents. Now, obviously, as a soulless entity, you can chalk it up to it literally being his lack of soul, and I think that's a reasonable assumption within the framework of the game. Yet I've seen observations that Flowey's behavior aligns very well with PTSD and depression, and as a child, he might not understand his own mental illnesses, or why he suddenly can't feel for others the way he used to. Regardless, neither Toriel nor Asgore were able to help him, and I think that when you consider how they handle Chris and Deltarune, as well as their ignorance to Kara's pain and resentment, it's possible that they simply could not fathom that Asriel could struggle with connections. 
Their inability to pick up on his problems may have further alienated him from them, whether you go with the PTSD approach or a literal inability to care, or even a combo of both. Without someone to pull him aside and actually resonate with him in his interpersonal struggles, it certainly pushed him further along into his mindset of people being useless beyond their value as amusing NPCs. While I don't think it's necessarily Toriel or Asgore's fault, the fact that Asriel wants to avoid people at the end of the game shows a level of guardedness and, in my eyes, a belief that he will be broken when he returns to flower form, even though his post pacifist monologue and the Alarm Clock app prove that this is simply not the case, as he retains his compassionate side and even cares for Toriel when she gets blackout drunk at the party. But crucially, I think Toriel and Asgore simply never taught Asriel about mental illness, trauma, and so on, because the idea of a child having to face such things was probably ludicrous to them, because all signs point to them struggling with the idea that a beloved child could feel such feelings, never mind their own personal struggles with mental health. It goes to show that their love can certainly backfire. But, as Undertale is a complete package, the story essentially ends with the alarm clock excerpts, unless Toby eventually reaches more content, like the comics he talked about on Kickstarter. Deltarune, however, remains an open book. So, what does this mean? You may be wondering, then, what I hope to gain from this discussion. What these observations can tell us going forward with Deltarune. Personally, I have a distinct feeling that the dreamer parents' lack of confronting or seeing Chris's struggles is going to be an important plot point going forward because, unlike Kara and Undertale, Chris is still alive. There's still a chance for things to get better. But I think for this to happen, both Toriel and Asgore need to go on Darkworld adventures. They need to see the ugly sides of themselves and Chris, understand Chris's needs, and resolve whatever baggage is left between them. I don't think Toriel and Asgore need to remarry for Chris to find happiness. Rather, I think it's very important for them and their parents to work through the myriad of unresolved problems weighing on the family. Things like the divorce are a part of it, sure, as well as Asgore losing his job, Asriel's overall distance since college, and Toriel's inability to understand Chris. And I'd argue that there's probably a ton of stuff between Chris and Asriel that needs to be talked about. He hasn't really kept a good amount of contact with them, even with the internet down, he could almost call. And there's the fact that Chris had to look up summer vacations in Queen's room for them, which suggests that this has been a lingering problem for quite some time. But I hope, if nothing else, this video has provided a different look at the two Dreamer parents, as this realization came to me on a whim a few weeks back and made me connect some fascinating dots. If you're still here and haven't seen it yet, my 42-minute Alfie's video has been out for about a month now. It's a huge love letter to the character, and I'd love it if you checked it out. I also have a ton of other video essay and theory content for Undertale and Deltarune, and you can find some examples linked in the cards above, in the description, and at the end. A special shout out to my patrons as always, as their continued support allows me to continue pursuing my creative passions rather than rotting away in a dead-end job. If you'd like to join the Patreon and get a ton of extra content, then you can follow the link on screen or in the description. I'm still planning future videos, and a lot of them are going to be more ambitious. I'd like to talk about Inverted Fate as kind of an overall encompassing view of the project for newcomers who only came here for my video essay content, and I think the Terra from Kingdom Hearts video is going to be one of the next projects, so stay tuned for that. I will still put out Undertale and Deltarune stuff, but I hope that by branching out I can reach an even wider audience. Thank you so much for all the recent subs, we've passed 16k, and I'm looking to continue going. Have a great day.